A reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all people, a banquet of rich food, a banquet of fine wines, of food rich and juicy, of fine strained wines. On this mountain, he will remove the morning veil covering all peoples and the shroud enwrapping all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord will wipe away the tears from every cheek. He will take away his people's shame everywhere on earth, for the Lord has said so. That day it will be said, see, this is our God in whom we hoped for salvation. The Lord is the one in whom we hoped. We exult and we rejoice that he has saved us for the hand of the Lord rests on this mountain. This is the word of the Lord. Responsorial Psalm, I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me to revive my drooping spirit. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness, no evil will I fear. You are there with your cook and your staff. With these you give me comfort. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed with oil. My cup is overflowing. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. A reading from the letter of support to the Philippians. I know how to be the poor and I know how to be rich too. I have been through my inundation and now I am ready for anything everywhere. Full stomach or empty stomach, poverty or plenty. There is nothing I cannot master with the help of the one who gives me strength. All the same, it was good of you to share with me in my hardships. In return, my God will fulfill all your needs in Christ Jesus, as lavishly as only God can. Glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please stand to welcome the gospel. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ enlighten the eyes of our heart that we might see how great is the hope in which we are called. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a feast for his son's wedding. He sent his servants to call those who had been invited but they would not come. Next he sent some more servants. Tell those who have been invited, he said, that I have my banquet all prepared. 
My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they were not interested. One went off to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was furious. He dispatched his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their town. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but as those who were invited proved to be unworthy, go to the crossroads in the town and invite everyone you can find to the wedding. So these servants went out onto the roads and collected together everyone they could find, bad and good alike. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to look at the guests, he noticed one man who was not wearing a wedding garment and said to him, How did you get in here, my friend, without a wedding garment? And the man was silent. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him out into the dark, where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the profound virtues, you might say, of the Israelites and Hebrews and the Jewish people was the virtue of hospitality. And whether it was a family, friend, or a relative, or even a complete stranger, to show hospitality was a noble and highly treasured virtue. You don't disrespect someone by not showing them hospitality. And so the image of the wedding feast, wedding banquet, was something that would have appealed naturally to the listeners of Jesus as they're hearing this parable. The other thing we also need to bear in mind is that when the Jews celebrated a wedding feast, the wedding banquet didn't last for five or six hours as ours do, but they would last for an entire week. So uh, you can imagine that when Jesus went, we don't know what day of the week the wine ran out, but it's a lot of wine. If you're providing for guests so they would eat all day and cheer away, and, and then when they've had plenty to drink, they would fall asleep and sleep on the premises and then wake up the next day and keep on feasting. I don't think I could party for a week. But anyway, they could. And this is why then on the other passage in the Gospel, you might recall where Jesus is asked, how is it that the disciples of St. John the Baptist's fast and the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours, but yours do not? And he says, well, you don't expect the, the, the guests to fast while the bridegroom is still with them. Because, you see, a devout Jew would also fast twice a week. I think it was Monday and Wednesdays. And whenever you went to a wedding banquet, well, then you were absolved from fasting that week. So Jesus uses the imagery of the wedding banquet to explain to them why they shouldn't be fasting just yet. So the king sends out the invitation, and the parable is about really God the Father sending out the invitation. The son's banquet is Jesus himself coming to marry his people. The servants are the prophets. So it's a really a continuation of last week's parable about the vineyard. You know, they maltreated the first group of servants and killed some of them, and then eventually they, he sends his son. So, okay, the first group don't respond. So this is aimed at his own people, Jesus here. So now go to the highways and byways and invite everyone you can find, good and bad alike. So if you've done that and now the wedding hall is full and you come to inspect the guests and you've put in good and bad alike, is everybody going to be good? Yes or no? It's not a trick question. No, absolutely not. You know, you've asked, you've sent out your servants to collect everybody, good and bad alike, or bad and good alike. So you expect to get some riffraffs into your wedding banquet. And 
therefore it seems a bit strange when the king comes to inspect the guests and he sees somebody without a wedding garment and says, hey mate, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? Hey, they didn't give us much notice, all right? It was, <laughs> all your servants were in a great hurry to get everybody in. They told us that we didn't have a, we didn't have a, a chance to go and get changed. But the fact that he falls silent indicates that he actually was guilty. So there's something else going on. What is it? You see, when you went to a wedding feast in Jewish times and Jewish faith, the, the host would actually offer you a wedding garment at the door, unless you already had one. So the fact that this guy was not wearing the wedding garment means that he tried to sneak in, and he did sneak in, and refusing to put on the wedding garment. In other words, he had attitude. He did not want to show the proper propriety and decorum that is worth and, and necessary for a wedding. He says, I am too good to be wearing a wedding garment. And that's why then he is cast out. So what this really presents to us is really something about human freedom. Why is it that those initially invited to the wedding feast turn away? A free banquet, sumptuous wine, great food, and then others do accept it. So I want to speak a little bit about this reality of human freedom because it's so much of what distinguishes us from the beasts. The, the beasts of the field serve God in their instinct, but we serve God in the tangle of our minds, St. Thomas More tells his daughter Margaret on one occasion. In fact, to give you the proper quote, he says, The angels serve God in their splendor. The beasts of the field serve God in their instinct but we serve God in the tangle of our minds. So what is this tangle of our minds? The human person is endowed with two spiritual qualities, which animals do not have. We have intellect and we have will or free will. Now intellect is not the brain. The brain is the gray matter inside our heads and it's the physical organ. We need it in order to be able to function. But intellect is actually something spiritual. It's our intelligence. Animals don't have intelligence. They learn things, yes, but they don't have intelligence. They don't have the capacity to reflect upon themselves and to examine themselves, whereas human beings do. And the role of the intellect is actually like a spiritual vacuum cleaner that just sucks in everything that it discovers in the created world, in things read, conversations with others. And these things are absorbed. And the intellect then stores them in the reservoir that we call the memory. But then the role of the intellect is to present what it considers as good to the will. And the human will is like a harpoon that goes out to whatever it recognizes as good. So the human mind recognizes things around it. Whatever it thinks is good, it presents it to the will, and the human will goes out as the harpoon to choose it. Now, this human will is indeed free because one person will consider to choose what is good and another one rejects it. And this is the mystery of free will, which is why also there is sin in the world. Now the human will recognizes what is truly good, but also it often is mistaken. It sometimes gets it wrong because the mind isn't clear. And afterwards, we'll choose something that we thought was good, and then later on we reject it because we recognize it was actually a wrong thing to choose. And so we repent and we, because we've sinned maybe. And I'm here I'm not even talking about just making bad judgment calls, you know. What's the best car to buy? What's the best, uh, I don't know, food processor or, or microwave for, for our household? And, and 
weighing up and down. Not even those sorts of things, although we are often mistaken on those things too. But moral choices, choosing what is good. And this is why God gives us so many chances to repent. God's mercy is infinite because we often choose what is right and we want to choose what is right and yet something within us betrays us, our own weakness, and we miss the mark. In fact, the Greek word for sin, hamartia, comes from an old archery imagery, the archer aiming at the target and he misses the mark. And so when we choose what is good and we instead miss what's good and choose sin instead, we miss the mark of virtue. Now, have you ever wondered, for instance, why God gives us so many chances to repent and turn to him again and again, and he didn't give the demons, the devil, any chance to repent? Have you ever wondered about that? Well, I have wondered about it too. I hope at least some of you have wondered about it. The seven o'clock mass this morning thought, huh, why, why would you be even asking that question? So anyway, they knew more than I did. But the reason why God doesn't give the demons a chance to repent is because demons, like angels, are pure spirits. They have a, a mind, an intellect, vastly superior to our own. And their willpower is far more intense than our own. They're pure spirits. They are angelic or demonic beings. They're the same nature. So if God were to give them a chance to repent, guess what they would do? They wouldn't repent. They would choose the same thing. They would choose to repent, to, to rebel against him through their pride. They wanted to be like God from the moment when they were tested and they would still want to be like God to give him competition. They don't want to serve him and they don't want to realize how beautiful it is to actually serve God. That's why God doesn't give the demons a chance to repent. They don't need redemption. But human beings, on the other hand, we often miss the target and so we need to repent again and again. Therefore, our will, although it's something good, it's often not steady and stable in choosing consistently what is truly good. And therefore we need to use all that is available to us to strengthen our will. This is why we teach children self-discipline. We teach them temperance and self-mastery. We teach them how to develop prudent judgment so that eventually we train them to exercise their choices, their will, in choosing what is consistently good. And this builds up a virtue, a power, a strength inside of them so that in the moments of greater difficulty they will find it easier to choose what is good rather than what is bad. Now the will also, when we sin, in moral theology, we talk about two different types of sin. Most of the time, sin is a sin of weakness. In other words, our passions, our emotions play up with us, our body's tired, our mind is dulled, and we just give in. Let me give you an example. I might, for instance, have the bad habit of gossiping about others. And so I would make a resolution and I say, I am not going to gossip anymore. And I'm okay for one day. And I'm even okay for three days. And then I'm talking to a friend of mine and I let my guard down. I've had a glass of wine, wham, and I fall into my old habit. I'm sure it's never happened to anyone here, by the way. So it's happened to me many times, or whatever it is. And I'll say, I won't do something and darn it, Two hours later, I've done the same thing. Why? Because there's well-trodden paths. We've practiced also doing the wrong thing. We're not perfect. And when we're trying to change our old ways to become more virtuous, to be more faithful in choosing what is good, it means change. And change is difficult and usually unwelcome even under the best conditions. So that's what's going on. My will, even though I can make a sincere choice to do what is good, will often betray me and let me down. So these are sins of weakness. But there's also another kind of sin, a sin of malice. 
This is where premeditated stuff comes in. It's one thing for somebody to say something to me that annoys me and I fly off the handle and I swear at them or I give them a piece of my mind. That's a sin of weakness. But it's another thing for me to carefully plan a robbery which might include murdering somebody. That's a very different process. That's a sin of malice and it's more grave. Now my will is being, instead of choosing what is good, I am now actively choosing what is evil. And this is where real personal corruption happens. Most sins committed in the world are often sins of weakness. But when occasionally we do see sins of malice, there's a much deeper conversion there that's required. So what can we do then to strengthen our willpower as adults, not just as children, as adults, and to remain confirmed in what is truly good? We need to use the means available to us. Daily prayer. To do sacrifices. The good habit of practical little mortifications. What's mortification about? It's not about, you know, giving ourselves the discipline or doing something outlandish. But rather, mortification, for instance, is denying ourselves little things which are good in themselves. But by denying ourselves things which are good, we actually prepare ourselves to say no to things that are bad. Let me give you an example. I might have sugar in my tea or coffee. And I might on one occasion say, no, I'm not going to have sugar in my tea or coffee. Yes, I put up with a bad taste and I sacrifice the joy and the sweetness of the sugar. But I'm also training my will to deny myself. So when the impulse comes to me to do something that betrays me into choosing something wrong or immoral, I will have a bit more strength of will to say no to that thing. It might be I'm very curious about what someone's talking about and I'll deny myself the curiosity of listening in on some conversation. Or I might be whatever. There's lots of little things that we can do. I don't want to tell you what to do, but practicing little mortifications. Maybe making myself always as comfortable as could be immediately. You know what? Maybe I can put up with a little bit of hardship like Christ did, denying myself little things. Secondly, to receive the sacraments worthily, the sacrament of the Eucharist in particular, but also the sacrament of reconciliation to strengthen my will. And I'm going to give you four reasons why we should receive this sacrament regularly. The church says we only need to receive it once a year as a minimum. And some saints have received it every day. That's probably too often, but the saints have felt they needed it, so they did. I'm, not, I'm no judge over the saints. But I often recommend once a month is a good habit to get into. I often receive it more regularly. Once a week I try to because I have difficulty remembering what I did, whatever, last week. So four reasons are these. One, to receive the forgiveness of God more regularly. This is no small thing. Whenever I repent of my sins, I actually am choosing what is good once again. And I'm going to God to ask for his healing and forgiveness. Two, whenever I receive the forgiveness of sins through the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament also gives me the power to resist sinning again in the future. It acts like a spiritual inoculation for me. And that, so it, it boosts my spiritual immune system. Thirdly, I receive the encouragement from the priest. We all need encouragement, particularly on that inner place of our hearts that is secret, not known to anyone else. And we might feel discouraged. And we might hear that voice saying, why are you bothering going to confession? You don't really need to go to confession for this or that thing. You haven't really done anything wrong. Aren't you embarrassed what the priest might think of you? Has anyone ever heard that voice before? Oh, I know, you're not just putting your hands up. You've, but I know you've heard it before. I see some of you nodding. That's not the voice of the angels, by the way. It's not the voice of God. We all need forgiveness of sins. We all need it regularly. That's the voice of the evil one, who is very jealous of us 
and wants us to turn away from God. So when he sees us walking towards the sacrament of reconciliation, he's going to do whatever he can to prevent us from receiving it. Because he knows if we go there, his kingdom in us, the kingdom of darkness, is going to be weakened. So that's number three, the encouragement. And number four, it's easier on our memory. So four reasons why we should receive the sacrament of penance or reconciliation more frequently or frequently. The forgiveness of our sins, the strengthening, the spiritual inoculation. Thirdly, a the encouragement that we receive. And fourthly, it's easier on our memory. We've all been invited to the banquet. The fact that we're here means we've taken yes. We've said yes to that invitation. But how deeply we eat. Do we just stick to the meat and potatoes? Or do we also enjoy some of the finer dishes that the Lord wants to give to us? The richness of his kingdom. The choice will always remain ours. The grace is there, but it's we who decide yes or no and by how much.